Welcome to Distribution Talk with Jason Bader, the show where we dive into the stories, struggles, and solutions from business owners and thought leaders in the wholesale distribution market. Hey folks, Jason here. In this episode, I had the pleasure of speaking with Yates Hudson. Yates is the general manager at Phoenix Fastener. And, uh, you know, as you'll hear throughout the episode, we talked about he had a long, long history with a company called Copper State Nut and Bolt. And that's where I ran across him. And that's where I've known him from. But kind of a fascinating account of his journey throughout uh, that fastener distribution world that really started out as a computer uh, consultant, computer expert, and really rolled his way through as many times we have in our privately held distribution is this internal progression or internal uh, promotion. And he moved his way and he found different things that he liked and glommed on to. And I think what was interesting about his story is that he really never stood still. He didn't just hang out in IT and keep developing the IT systems. He decided to take on another responsibility, which you know was sales or another responsibility, which was inventory management, and really just diversified his knowledge base along the way and became so valuable in this organization that uh, they had to let him go, which uh, you know was a uh, challenging time in his life, as he will share. But uh, because of his ability to create relationships and really network outside of his organization, really become a part of the Fastener community. And I think that's really the important lesson I took away from this interview is that sometimes we get so hyper-focused and myopic about the management and the running of our own businesses that we don't take the time to go out and network and really see who else is out there and develop relationships outside of our four walls. And that's something that uh, Yates really, uh, really attributes his ability to jump back into the business. It's because he did that and he did that very effectively. So I truly enjoyed this uh, interview with him and, and learning a little bit about uh, more about his story. And I really hope you all do too. This episode of Distribution Talk is sponsored by InSQL Distribution Software. InSQL is a fully functional distribution-based software package. I only recommend software packages that were purpose-built to serve distribution. And these folks do it very well at a price point many smaller distributors can afford. Economy doesn't mean compromise. This company is on the cutting edge of distribution-friendly applications like VMI on mobile devices, mobile signature capture, mobile CRM, warehouse management software, and e-commerce development. If you're ready to step up to a fully loaded, scalable distribution package at an affordable price, look no further than InSQL Distribution Software at www.insql.com. That's I-N-X-S-Q-L dot com. Well, hi, Yates. Uh, welcome to Distribution Talk. Thank you so much for uh, taking the time to be with me. Thanks, Jason. Thanks for inviting me. It's going to be a great conversation. Uh, you and I have kind of uh, been around each other a long time uh, in, in our businesses. So, uh, yeah, I'd love to hear a little bit about, you know, the history and uh, yeah, your history getting into that uh, fastener distribution business and really what drew you in. So take it from the top. I'm probably one of those typical guys that started in the fastener business, but didn't think he was going to be in the fastener business. And uh, one of the first people I worked with said, hey, welcome to the fastener business. This is an industry you'll never leave. You'll never make it out. Kind of like the mafia. You're never going to make it out. Somewhat like a mafia. And it's kind of crazy. Yeah, I started out as a computer guy. I had a good project to work on. I had exciting stuff to do. You know, you go to school, you learn how to program. And it's like, hey, I got an opportunity to be the guy. Did not expect to be the guy in the faster industry for now. I'm going on 39 years. It's a long tenure, man. That's, uh, yeah, something about it you must have liked. So again, you, tell me about the project that kind of you started on in that computer side. You know, again, it sounds like you're more of a computer science guy. And uh, tell me a little bit about that project and what that was in that uh, led you into that uh, staying with the fastener business. I was going to U of A. I was a senior and uh, had a part-time job and needing a full-time job. And one of the the people that was a, a frequent customer of a gas station I worked at 
was the VP of Copper State. Oh, okay. Okay. They had bought a computer. They had software, but this, I'm talking 1984. So they, they had no clue how to run the computer. They had no clue how to do anything. So just through getting to know people that come into a station, I met the guy and I'm just like, well, I can probably help you out. And um, that led from, you know, me helping them not only, you know, be able to log people on and create accounts and whatnot to developing an ERP system. So it was a project that I thought would take, you know, a year or two. And uh, it took about five years to do everything from receivables, payables, order entry, purchase order processing. It had a good start on the warehouse. In fact, uh, we started doing scanning where we're using, you know, RF scanners, you know, probably within five years after that. So we were at the forefront. The bleeding edge of that scanning technology, sure. We truly were. And TRW helped push us into that. So we had a, a customer that was making auto airbags and uh, they were bought out by Textron. They had, you know, a big push on IT and EDI, which were things that uh, you heard about in school, but you didn't know a lot sure. about. So there was always, you know, exciting little tidbits that would come up work-wise that uh, really kept me interested. And then, you know, the people in the industry kind of kept me around because uh, you develop friendships, not only with the company where you're working, but with the folks that you're working with, whether they're internal or external. So you were mentioning that, you know, you were going through and you were kind of developing an ERP. Did you actually build that kind of from scratch? Was that a homegrown uh, system? It was absolutely homegrown. So we had uh, smart term was the actual terminal emulator that we used and thoroughbred which was a california company they developed the compiler but we developed all the programs yeah i'm thinking about you know modern distribution software now you know and all the different components and the modules and things how did you know what to put in this thing to make it work <laughs> <laughs> those were things that were dumbass luck yeah yeah okay i truly uh, didn't know a lot but at the time we had an auditor kpmg and uh, they were pretty helpful. You know, they would say, okay, you have to do this. You have to meet these tests. And and it wasn't like, hey, you got to do this overnight. They would come in probably always at the end of the year for an audit, and then they would come in periodically. And uh, they would say, okay, here's the next step. So literally, we started with the accounting systems and then went to the first customer order processing, then purchase order processing. Before I started working full-time, I had already developed an inventory system because that was the main thing that the individual that hired me wanted. And we we did that probably, that little bitty system probably took three months and everything else took several years. That's interesting, you know, because that's... Uh... It's before the Gordon Graham book came out, you know, so it's just it was just a few years prior to Gordon Graham releasing and a lot of people, you know, developed their software based on that. But it's interesting how you all kind of came to that uh, conclusion that you really wanted to focus on inventory. And, uh, you know, and I think that's really what makes it a uniquely distribution software package. You know, when you do focus on that inventory piece. Absolutely. And, and for, you know, the fastener industry, that that makes you king. If you can't control that commodity and there's items that, that turn monthly or weekly and there's other items that turn yearly, if you can't, you don't have a good handle on that. I mean, you're not going to be very good at customer service and it's going to cost you a ton of money. So how long did you all run on the homegrown system? Till 2012, actually. Oh, oh wow. Yeah. No, so, oh, really? Oh, okay. I'm with you. And it went through very various iterations. Sure, Thoroughbred sure. was bought out by a company called Concept Omega, and Concept Omega is still around. I think even Thoroughbred is still around. But we migrated to Microsoft AX Dynamics, which that probably wasn't the best idea. So I would, you know, in hindsight, you always know, Oop. <laughs> man, we made a mistake there. But any system today, I think, is more than adequate than what we had. Was it customized doing everything we wanted to do the way we wanted to do it? Nah. But uh, 
you know, the, the systems are now for support where early on it was like, all right, how do we get bigger, you know, faster, better? Yates, it's kind of interesting to me. Uh, you started out, you know, again, computer science guy building the software, really working in that IT side of the business, yet you ascended through the organization to vice president, general manager, you know, moved into, you know, what would be an interesting transition because generally speaking, you know, I don't see a lot of folks uh, ascending into those positions from the IT position. I guess unless you were born into the company, it just generally doesn't work that way. So how did that work for you? I mean, why, why were you tapped to move into these different roles in the organization? It was out of need small companies. And at the time I started, the company was a $10 million company, which, you know, at the time that was a good sized company, but we wanted to become a $20 million company and sales cure all ills. While I was developing applications, I actually up, ended up managing a branch and uh, I kind of fell into that role just because, okay, this guy's responsible. He comes to work every day. He likes working with people. He can absolutely train the people how to use the systems because he's the knucklehead that, that wrote it. You know, I started managing a branch, and, uh, and this is, again, uh, now we're mid-80s to late-80s. Took a little branch that was struggling to do a hundred grand, and we got it to half a million dollars, which was rivaling the mothership. It, it said, okay, maybe maybe this guy that's a computer geek can also sell. <laughs> yeah. So literally, I went from being a branch manager, and, and I kept my IT hat until the mid-90s, but uh, the sales were where it was at for the company. I enjoy sales. I mean, I enjoy working with customers. I enjoy the challenge. I, I enjoy the competitiveness. If you're not getting competition from the sports you're playing, boy, sales is a great venue. Yeah. You know, it's an interesting personality trait because, again, I don't see a lot of the IT folks that I know and work with and have been around the IT side for a long time gravitating towards sales. It just doesn't seem to be an interest or an aptitude, one or the other. So you're very unique in that way that sales came to you. I would say those IT people are probably better IT people than I was. <laughs> gotcha. Okay. Fair <laughs> enough. Fair enough. So uh, as you kind of moved in uh, to sales and sales management and things, how much did you utilize your kind of analytical background? This is something that I'm looking at right now a lot with sales management that I like to see sales managers that understand software and they can pull data and they can understand data. And it sounds like you had a head start at that. Absolutely. Where I really had a head start was recognizing if we're going to get it to scale, it wasn't just me selling. And so in the mid-90s, I also went back and got my MBA. And uh, at ASU, they had a program where you could focus on finance. It wasn't just a, a general MBA. So that's the track I took. And uh, I developed a compensation plan for salespeople that gave them the incentive where the sky was the limit. I just needed to be there to support them. And I would love to tell you I was a great salesperson. I actually got really lucky, had great people that I got to work with, and they were incentivized to stick around. And I can tell you through mid-2012, 2015, most of them were hitting pretty high marks. And that's what accounted for our growth. You know, it, it is interesting looking at sales compensation. This is something that comes up all the time. You know, everybody wants to fiddle around with their sales compensation. And I'll tell you, if you can keep it relatively simple, and I, I think one of the keys here is can the salespeople understand it? And this is something that I tend to be baffled when I speak to salespeople and I ask them to explain their comp package and they, they can't. Uh, it's so convoluted and has so many agendas and initiatives in there that it's so convoluted. And then their management or the owner of the company doesn't understand why the salespeople aren't performing. I guess they can't understand how to get paid. Yeah. No, it's 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 got to be a win-win. can't set it up where people don't have the incentive to work and you can't set it up where the company can't pay the people to do the work. But we actually had a plan where a guy could run a report at the end of the day and he knew 
where he stood. And we paid them out quarterly. So at the end of the quarter, they could sit down and they didn't have to wait for their check to know what uh, they were getting. They could look. And sometimes they were in the money, sometimes they weren't in the money, but there were no surprises. There were no bad people in accounting having to deliver negative messages. It was all very, very well known. And I agree with you. Not many people like that keep it simple strategy. That's always worked well for me. And uh, I can tell you where, where I've seen success, people have kind of followed that recipe. I would agree. Yeah, it's just... Um, oh, one of my best friends is dealing with a situation, a completely separate industry. But, you know, these folks changes comp plan every quarter. Nobody knows how the comp plan works uh, until 90 days or two months into it. And then they're going to change it again 30 days later. It's just miserable. And I think it's really just a foolish exercise, you know, when people uh, do things like that. I think they're putting their attention on the wrong things. If you're constantly fiddling around with a comp plan, where's the strategy in selling stuff? They don't have time for strategy at that point. There isn't. You need to focus on growing the business. Yeah. I mean, yeah. let those little details take care of themselves. Sure, sure. Well, I digress. Let's get back to the fastener business and kind of what makes it a little bit unique and what's interesting and uh, some of the things you found fascinating. I mean, you know, you and I have talked about uh, importing, for example. That's something a little bit unique. So could you share a little bit about your experience with that? As we grew, we, we were a manufacturer who did a lot of distribution sales that had import parts. And as our customer base grew, we had customers that we needed to remove the middleman. And so first we went to Taiwan and China and, and then Korea. And uh, all, all those countries, we were receiving material through importers, very, very high quality material, meeting these people at uh, the trade shows. There, at the time, we used to have two trade shows a year, and then they reduce it down to the one that's in Vegas. But just through networking and talking to the folks at the trade show, that led to, in the early 2000s, us making pretty frequent trips overseas in order to, it's hard to, to sell something if you can't stand behind it. And with some of the, with the wind projects and the solar projects, we needed to go over and just make certain that these people have the quality systems. We can look our customer in the eye and say, absolutely, they have the product and the, the systems necessary to make certain that your parts are going to come out as you expect them to, to the standard you expect them to. We also had a good partner in, with the people that um, we were importing through. So they had to recognize that they couldn't get 100% of the business. At the time, we were their biggest partners or one of their biggest partners. But for us to continue to grow, they had to recognize that some of that material was going to go direct to us and not two-step it because it couldn't be done. And I, I think for the introductions, I think they were getting a commission or they were getting you know, some type of compensation on the side. It didn't go through us. I didn't really care about it, but uh, that is really, really helpful. I can tell you that type of business ebbs and flows though. I know that uh, in 2020, when uh, we started having the supply chain get clogged, people got burned on that material once it started flowing in again because you couldn't get it fast enough and then you couldn't turn the spigot off fast enough. It's a double-edged sword. I think that any business of any size probably has a segment that they need to be able to go direct. But what really excites me is you know, any business that we can manufacture and make certain that uh, the customer knows, hey, American made and you're getting the best of the best. So were you all private labeling these fasteners that you would bring in? Did you uh, do any of that kind of thing? We weren't. So th these parts had to be PPAPed. You know, they, it's very transparent when, uh, when you're going gotcha. direct because uh, the customers are big enough. They probably could go direct themselves, but they don't want to do that. They need, they need a partner to manage that part of the supply chain. And that's what we were good at. Mm-hmm. Well, it is. It's a it's a fascinating business. Um, if you do it right, the margins are strong. Um, there's a lot to it. I mean, there's a lot, of, you know, but 
as you said, uh, you can get burned by, uh, you know, supply flow. Yeah, and it, it it's kind of like having dinner. You you go you want your meat, you want your vegetables, and and your dessert. You can't have too much of either one of them. Sure. If you're going to be a healthy distributor, you better have a good mix of what products you're running through your organization. And if it's all import, you're going to have really high times and you're going to have really low times. Gotcha. And especially when you worked with uh, government projects or things, then you had to be careful and you had to really then balance that with domestic sources. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Out West, to be honest with you, especially with some of the, you know, the hospital work and you know, that, that type of activity, it's all domestic. But then a lot of the Vegas work, a lot of the stadiums, actually, that's private money. And even though it was bid on bonds, they had pretty tight purses that they needed the most competitive parts. So the Cardinal Stadium, there's a lot of Korean fasteners in there. There's a lot of new core fasteners and a lot of domestic parts that were made, you know, here in the West. But it needed to be done as cost effectively as possible. And so that's why you need to have a good mix. So you mentioned, you know, Korean fasteners, Taiwanese, you know, all these different uh, countries. If you were going out and trying to import now, where do you think people should be looking? I know that there's some people that are saying South America, Central and South America, you know, might be another place. But uh, where do you think you would go hunting now if you, uh, if you. U.S. To, what's that? The USA. No, I'm teasing. <laughs> I will say that, uh, you know, in the last, especially the last five years, the United States has become super duper new core. I mean, they're super competitive gotcha. relative to imports on. And I'm I'm talking about the structural market. Korea is good. Taiwan is good. China is good, too. But there's just issues that uh, you have dealing with them. But uh, if you were going to pick. Two A players, it would be them. You do have India, you do have Indonesia, like you mentioned. They do good work. I can tell you, my brief stint with Park Ohio, we we dealt with India quite a bit, and uh, and not just on fasteners, on tooling parts. So um, those people are just as sophisticated as our big OEMs. So it was we never had any problems, but I I think it's because. The relationships were built up front first, and you kind of knew who you were dealing with. So if I could here, I want to uh, segue a little bit and transition, you know, kind of away from that, uh, the nuts and bolts, uh, you know, no pun intended, of the fastener business to uh, over to uh, your transition leaving uh, Copper State. You know, you'd spent you know, your career there. You built the software. You, you, you were right there. And then all of a sudden, man, something happened. There was 32 years there. And those were 32 good years. It, uh, I learned a lot. I developed a lot of friendships within the organization, outside the organization. But, you know, with privately held companies, uh, if you're not the guy that owns the company, you're expendable. You know, and that goes for everybody. I mean, it, even the owners are expendable to a point, I guess. But uh, that was not a, a happy event, but um, it wasn't a bad event. I mean, looking backward, everything's a blessing. You just don't recognize it at the time. For sure. You know, it's, it's like, well, I just got handed dog shit, but it really <laughs> it wasn't. It was, it was much better than that. And fortunately for me, relationships that have been developed, those are the really important things. You know, you you can develop technical expertise. You can develop a lot of things that people focus on. But uh, the relationships you develop, not only within your organization, but outside the organization, that's really what's going to make your career. The building could burn down and you're needing to go find a new building. And if you're not able to transition then you're going to be stuck and it's not going to be a happy place. But uh, yeah, I was blessed the way things happened. It was probably more than time for me to depart, you know, my one and only job at the time. Truly that departure just opened up other doors that I didn't realize were available. You and I, in a previous conversation, talked a lot about that, that importance of networking. And, you know, I think that often people can get their, uh, their blinders on and really, you know, too hyper focused on what's happening between their walls. And if you don't develop these relationships outside of your organization, 
in the fastener industry or just maybe in the dis- uh, distribution industry in general, um, you know, you're going to find yourself in a difficult position. Fortunately, you, uh, you know, through different board positions, uh, I believe you were involved with, uh, was it the Western Fasteners? WAFTA and PacWest. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, and the other thing, if I were advising a young guy in the fastener industry or even a middle-aged guy, mentorships. If I had had a mentor early on, and that's not to say I didn't. I mean, I just didn't listen. Uh, but if there were active mentors in my life, I probably would have transitioned sooner. And there's always business decisions, whether it's the employee making the decision or the employer. And uh, people need to recognize that uh, there are folks out there that want to see you do well and care about you just because you've developed a relationship or you've had some effect on their life. Those are people that are worth listening to. You know, I think that uh, associations um, have, I don't have struggles, the right word, but I know that they have always tried to create these active mentorships programs. And, and I have heard a couple associations, you know, talk about how they try to put people together, at least from maybe a networking and, and maybe one is one person's more senior than the other. But uh, they really do try to foster that idea. And I think that's uh, it would be something that a trade association should aspire to, is to put programs together like that. I don't mean to plug the PacWest, but I'm going to plug the PacWest a bit because that's one organization I spend a lot of time with. And the friendships that you develop, early on, I was questioned, hey, what's the value? What's the value? And at the time... You know, we were trying to develop part number systems. We were, you know, sharing our experience with uh, scanning solutions and whatnot for warehouse management. And so, you know, it was looked at as, well, this is all give. What are we getting back? And, you know, that was never the case because as we gave, we were receiving. We just, we just weren't really valuing what we were getting. I was because... I was meeting people that, uh, you know, Bruce Wheeler with Star Stainless that explained to me, hey, this is the way you really need to manage inventory. Uh, Again, I've been really blessed with the people that, you know, I've developed friendships with. Isn't it amazing in these associations or groups, how willing people are to offer, you know, suggestions and help? I think that's one of the things that maybe newer folks do not understand that, you know, oh, well, why should I have to go to that? Or why why go to that event? Well, it's not for the golf outing or something like that. It's really to introduce yourself to people who are very open about trying to help you be successful. And all you have to do is ask. All you have to do is just, you know, come up to them and say, hey, I'm new in the industry. Um, can you give me some advice? And, and You know, there are a whole lot of gray hairs saying, absolutely, I would love to share my advice. Absolutely. And as a group, we can either manage ourselves, like when we were trying to implement the Fastener Quality Act back in the 90s, or we can have the government come in and police us. And the latter wasn't a very good option. So having people share information, and again, you can either have the scarcity mentality that it's mine, 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 mine. I can't share. Or you can go in with the, the attitude that I'm going to make this better for all of us because it's a big world. It's a lot better doing it the capitalistic way where you know everyone's creating a path for good or you, you can go and be managed by a government, which would not be that fun. Every once in a while, I'll go to these events, and oh, I'm going to get myself in trouble as usual, but uh, yeah, I'll go to these events where they'll bring in a congressional member or somebody like that you know, to, to speak, and it helps me understand how out of touch people you know, with private business people. It's like, man, come on. You know, and there's a good reason I live on the West Coast. I'm just going to say that out loud, <laughs> so uh, <laughs> even though all my clients are on the East Coast, but uh, anyhow... Um, So as a result of this networking and and really kind of being a part of the community, not just a uh, sideline observer here, you uh, had a couple other stops along the way, but then really you landed back in the fastener business. Yeah, I've now landed with Birmingham Fastener, and, and that's a company, again, through networking. We always looked up to them. When you're a little company and you're doing 
you know, 50 million and you're looking at someone else and they're kind of in the same pond, you're always curious. And uh, one of the things that uh, I always appreciated with some of my competitors was the culture that they made because you can't fake culture. You can talk about it. And, you know, you can get into the conference rooms and kind of pat each other on the back. But one thing that was really, really cool to me that I saw was just the community and the culture that that competitor had. And when the door opened up for me to leap in on that side, I could not have been more excited to do it. And uh, they have me focusing on just the Phoenix market. And it's not just the Phoenix market. It's much bigger than that. But it is the game that I understand. I really enjoy. I enjoy the customer base, the fellowship that I have with uh, teammates, because even though I'm in Phoenix, I can tell you that, you know, I've been in Texas. I've been in Alabama. I've been in Atlanta. I've been all over where we have locations because, uh, you know, they want to make certain that I understand. And at the same time, we're sharing things that we can do for each other that uh, just benefit the whole team. Well, I think, you know, you've got this long history. As you said, you've only, you know, you only had one job for a long time there, but you had a diversity of jobs in there. I mean, you really had a diversity of responsibilities and looking through, you know, from a technology standpoint to, you know, managing and designing sales compensation and and sales people, branch management, and uh, also, you know, really the procurement side, looking at that inventory management, but then you have this huge diversity. So bringing that in, there was a lot they could learn from you as well, my friend. That's part of the fun sharing. And I can tell you, there's literally, there has been campfire stories shared on, all right, how did this play out and how does this go? So some places are a lot more fun to work at. And uh, this will be my last job because I thought I was retired last year. <laughs> now I'm not, but I'm not because, you know, it's it's just too fun not to be. Yeah, it's funny. Actually, uh, I think you just uh, coined my new uh, podcast name, Campfire Stories in the Distribution <laughs> Business. I think that's my new, that, that's it right there, Campfire Stories. There's only going to be a handful of people listening that recognize what I'm talking about, but I am I'm literally talking about Campfire Stories. <laughs> Fair enough. You know, that is one of the wonderful things, you know, as I've had my career as well throughout the business, um, it is those folks that I can sit around. And I do remember Camp Forest Fire Stories in ski resorts or places like that where we're around a, a big fire and swapping stories. And that's just a, a great part of my career. I mean, that's something that I've just, you know, absolutely enjoyed and frankly allows me to do what I do today. So it is, it's that networking in that uh opportunity to share your own ideas and then be willing to listen. That's the other part of it as well, is you, you can't always be try to be the smartest guy in the room. And, and I've seen those people. Yeah, I've seen those people in the in these uh, meetings. Yeah, I, I have a difficult time with that. <laughs> <laughs> as do I, sir, as do I. Well, you know, before I let you go, I just want to take a couple seconds and ask going back to the uh, the boards and, you know, WAFTA and that ultimately became PacWest. You participated in their board and the governance and the leadership in those organizations. Why did you raise your hand? Why did you say, I want to be a part of this? That was something that uh, you just feel responsible. You go to a few of the meetings and I can tell you, I mean, it's not just industry boards that I do that for. I'm involved in other boards, my kids' soccer. You know, I got a gun club where I, I train my dog. You want to get back, at least that's always been my take. And with WAFTA, and which became PacWest, it's better to row the boat and to add to what they're trying to accomplish than it is to just kind of paddle along. So, and that that's just been the way I've been built. It's, uh, and most people, I can tell you, most people that do get on the boards, other than maybe, you know, if it's a homeowners association, I don't know if I would do that, but. Uh, Neither would I. <laughs> Neither would I. These are worthy you know, organizations that, that are, are building value. And so it's, it's just fun to be part of that. Well, and I've enjoyed, uh, you know, my relationship with PacWest for uh, 
a number of years. I always love to get up in front and, uh, you know, spend some time with that group. Uh, and I think it's the diversity of, uh, of people that are in that room. I think that's the most interesting thing for me. And so I've always enjoyed that part of, uh, working with uh, really any fastener organization. But, uh, you know, that the PacWest uh, has always been a, uh, a really enjoyable event for me to work. Absolutely. I can relate to that. Yeah. Well, Yates, thank you so much for taking the time. You know, this has just been a pleasure, you know, learning a little bit more about, as I said, you know, our paths have crossed over the years, but it's just been a pleasure learning a little bit more about your history and, and your journey through uh, distribution. So thank you for sharing with us. Hey, Jason, thank you. Thank you for having me on. I I was excited to talk to you. And, and truthfully, this went super fast. So I know, I know it, it always does. It does. You look at the time, you're like, hey, all right, we got to wrap this bad boy up. So. All right. Well, hey, I look forward to the next time our paths cross. All right, sir. Thank you so much. Thank you for listening. If you liked what you heard, consider sharing with your friends and colleagues. And don't forget to follow the show on your favorite podcast application. Links to sponsors, products, and services mentioned during this episode can be found in the show description area or at www.distributiontalk.com. Com. Distribution Talk is edited and mixed by the brilliant team at the Creative Imposter Studios. This episode was brought to you by my company, The Distribution Team. We are a consulting services firm dedicated to helping wholesale distribution clients remove barriers to profitability, generate wealth, and achieve personal goals. To learn more about how we can help your company succeed, check us out at www.thedistributionteam.com.